Well, that ended quick. <laughs> I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> uh, this is, I believe, the sixth message in the series called uh, Perfect Strangers. And we've said each week that it all comes from the book of First Peter. We've just kind of gone line for line, and we're going to continue to do that. And in the book of First Peter, though, it emphasizes that, that people that have been reconciled to God, that are now living by faith in Christ, their creator, aligning their life with his truth, the principles that he created us to live by, that, that we can appear to be strange to the masses of our society. It's kind of an ironic thing because we're essentially uh, pursuing normalcy. We're finally living the way that our creator designer intended us to live but in our society, that can be jarring. That can be shocking. We, we look different. We have a, a very different worldview. We don't just see things from a temporal standpoint. We know since Christ our Creator came into this world, died on the cross and rose again, that life goes on after the grave. And so we live with an eternal perspective. Because of that, we have a very different set of values. Uh, things that people that are just living desperately, wondering how much more time they have, they, you know value quite highly may not mean as much to us because we know that we have an eternal destiny. We have a whole different way of handling relationships. We have a whole different set of motivations. We have a whole different purpose. There's lots of things that make us seem strange to those that are outside of Christ. We come to a, su a subject today that perhaps of all the things that make us appear to be strange as Christians, as followers of Christ, this one, it's, it's our view of suffering. Uh, suffering is one of those topics that no one really wants to think about. We certainly don't desire it, not anyone. It's something that we hope we'll be able to avoid, at least to some degree, and yet in our better moments, we kind of know that's likely impossible in this life. Suffering is one of those interesting subjects that some people that consider themselves intellectuals use to uh, determine validity to their reason for not believing in God. And the way it goes is like this. They say, listen, if God is all-powerful, and if he's all-good, why does he allow all this suffering and injustice that goes on in the world? You know, why the Holocaust? Why brutal crimes and so on? They say he either can't be all-powerful or he can't be all-good. He can't be both because if he's all-powerful and all-good, he would stop suffering. And they then smugly believe that that's a good reason to conclude that God doesn't exist. Or, in some cases, they conclude that if he does exist, he's not worth knowing. Now, they never seem to consider that if he's the creator of the universe, the creator of the atom itself, and all of life, that just maybe he has a thought or two that goes beyond their capacity. But it's a comfortable position because, you see, when you can somehow convince yourself that God doesn't exist, that makes you being God a lot more comfortable. And you can just do whatever you want to do. And... Your conscience will allow it for a season, to some measure. Truth be told, this same position is held by some people that would call themselves Christians. Now, the Christians, or the ones that call themselves Christians, they, they do it a little differently, but it's essentially the same thing. They try to say that the God who would allow suffering, the almighty, all-good God who allows suffering, is so undesirable that they find a way to twist his scripture, to exclude parts of his scripture, to ignore them altogether, so that they develop an image of God that's not the God of the Bible. In other words, God has chosen to reveal himself to us and have it preserved in print, but these folks that call themselves Christians go to that revelation, take pieces of it, twist other parts of it, and then they come up with an image of God that is not the real God, not the real Jesus. Their image of God, or Jesus, is something like this. As long as you put your faith in him and trust him and claim his promises, you should never suffer. Their Jesus never wants anyone to suffer who is his follower. And their Jesus just waits for us to 
exercise what they call our faith and claim his promises and we can alleviate all suffering from our life. There Jesus wants all of his followers to kind of live in a bubble existence where we're healthy, wealthy, wise, we always prosper, nothing bad ever happens to us and if something bad seems to be getting close, all we have to do is pray a prayer, claim it in faith and then Jesus, the bellhop in the sky, comes swooping down and delivers us from all suffering and if we have suffering, it must mean that we don't have enough faith because he wants us to be prosperous and healthy and wealthy and wise and never suffer. Now, that's a false Jesus. That's just about as bad a position as the atheistic position that I mentioned earlier because that's not the real God. And I can guarantee you that those folks that call themselves Christians that hold to that kind of teaching, they will be destroyed at some point in this life because they are utterly unequipped to handle reality. They will be confused, they will be disappointed, they will probably end up bitter and in many cases depart from God altogether. Why? Because they never really had a faith in Christ to begin with. They had faith in a false image that they had created but not the real Christ. No, the truth be told we're going to see in scripture today, nothing could be more blunt or clear. The real God, the loving God, the almighty God, the all good God says absolutely, positively, take it to the bank, don't think it's strange, you'll hear that language. We experience suffering, everyone, righteous, unrighteous, good, bad, devoted, non-devoted, everything and everyone in between. In this age of ours, we experience suffering, and no one goes without it. Now, the same God also promises, though, that he's going to intervene in human history at his own time when his purposes and plans are completed, and he will forever end suffering, forever. But for now, he's working in the context of suffering. He's bringing good out of the evil of suffering for his own purposes. And that's the truth that in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, we're going to come face to face with. And that makes we Christians strange in our ideas about suffering because we accept its temporal inevitability. We just believe it's, it's inevitable. We also respect its eternal potentiality we think that suffering out of suffering a good God can bring something good in us through us and to the world even out of suffering and that makes us strange because folks most people that are apart from God you know they're living desperately they don't know how long they're gonna live there they don't know when they're gonna die they're trying to grab as much pleasure and enjoyment as they can and the last thing they want is to think about large blocks of time that might be consumed with suffering that just wrecks the whole you know, trip for them. But as Christians, as followers of Christ, we can look in the worst that life deals out, the very worst. We can look into the heart of the most grim kind of suffering and know our God is with us. He's prepared us for it. He told us it's not to be considered strange. And he will work in us and through us, sustaining us and maybe using us for some grand purposes that we could never even understand initially if we'll embrace this truth. The strange truth about suffering. Well, last week we were in 1 Peter chapter 3, and uh, I skipped a, a portion in there, verses 18 through 22, because I said that I had gone too long in the message, and it was a very complex portion of Scripture. It's considered one of the most difficult in the entire New Testament. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to actually unpack that for you as the intro, sort of, of this message, and then we're going to get into chapter 4, which is pretty much where... Uh, we'll spend the well it is entirely where we'll spend the rest of our time but I first want to go to chapter uh, 3 before we do go there though let me remind you of the context of first Peter remember I told you in earlier weeks that when first Peter was written when Peter was writing this to the Christians they were experiencing for the very first time persecution from the Roman Empire it would be as if tomorrow we wake up and just being a Christian means that we may have our houses raided, our goods confiscated, we may lose our jobs, we may be carted off to jail or even executed. That's what these Christians were suddenly experiencing. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The Roman Empire controlled the world of their day. And so Peter is writing to these Christians who are in dire circumstances and trying to assure them that God hasn't blinked, he hasn't gone to sleep, he's not caught by surprise, he hasn't abandoned his people, but that this is actually something that was par for the course he points to Jesus himself as one that suffered brutality of the Roman Empire as well as the Jews and then points to his victory 
But the persecution started under Nero, I reminded you. You know, Rome was burned. Uh, the word is, is that Nero probably did the burning, but then when the citizens got angry, he pointed to the Christian community and blamed it on them, and that's what gave him the right to start persecuting the Christians. And this was the start in 64 AD of 10 cycles of persecution of Christians by the Roman Empire. It went on for 260 years, nearly nonstop. Let me just quickly show you a little, little graph here. And this is just the history of Roman persecutions. You can see the one that started under Nero. And by the way, Nero killed the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, some other famous names in the New Testament that I jotted down that he killed. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla from Romans 16 he killed. And uh, Andronicus and Jania from Romans 16 he killed. A guy named Aristarchus and Epaphras from the book of Colossians he killed. He killed Silas from Acts chapter 15, and he killed Onesiphorus from 2 Timothy chapter 4. So a lot of people we read about in Scripture, Nero wiped out. But important, two of the biggest names, the Apostle Peter, the, considered the Apostle to the Jews, and the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle to the Gentiles. Paul being the writer of 13 New Testament books, Nero wiped them out. You would have thought it would have made the Christian church extremely weak, but it didn't. It spread like wild through the Roman Empire. Then it went on under Domitian, little breaks in between, and then under Trajan, you can see it. Then persecution under Aurelius for a good long period of time, the martyrdom of one of the church fathers, Polycarp. Persecution under Severus and the martyrdom of Perpetua. I almost used the story of Perpetua. It's an amazing story, 21-year-old girl, her martyrdom, uh, but, but I, I, unfortunately I won't be using that today. Let's go on to the next part. The persecution under Decius, Christians are actively sought out by requiring public sacrifice. In other words, they were rounded up, and you were required to get into the arena and offer a sacrifice to the emperor, which means you were saying that the emperor is Lord, and for a Christian, no way. That meant you were going to die. Persecution under Valerium and uh, Maximus, Thrace, the Thracian, and then finally the last one, severe persecution under Diocletian and Galerius. Diocletian had as his goal to completely stamp out all copies of the scripture to destroy them and he went after the Christians as hard as he could only to two years later have Constantine become the emperor who supposedly converted to be a Christian himself and then Christians were free from that point on to worship in the Roman Empire but for 260 years being a Christian meant you were a criminal in your own world and that's why Peter was writing, preparing these believers for the sufferings that they would undergo. So this gives us a little bit of understanding of the background. Now, I left off in chapter 3, a very difficult portion of Scripture, but I want to give you the essential meaning, and then we'll go in and unpack it line by line. Peter was trying to emphasize the point that even though the Christians were being bullied and pushed around and treated as inconsequential and persecuted, that they were still the sons and daughters of God and that they were going to rule and reign. Not to be, you know, confused by the circumstances. And he's pointing toward Jesus. That Jesus looked beaten too by the Jews in the Roman Empire. But he rose from the grave and he became conqueror of all the spiritual entities and ruler of the universe. He points back to Noah. He says, you know, Noah looked like just a, a crazy man and everybody mocked him in his day. But everything changed when God stepped in and decided to judge. And then the flood took all except Noah and his family, eight and all. Now, let me go into these scriptures now that you kind of understand the main thrust of what Peter is trying to establish to give the Christians confidence. It may look bad for you now, but you're still God's exalted ones. You're his perfect strangers. So let's look at the text because it is a difficult one. Let's start with verse 18, chapter 3. It says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. This is the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, paying for our sins, which is meant to move us to put faith in Christ and return to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Just means that his body was crucified and died on the cross, but his spirit went into the underworld. We'll see the, the place that was called Hades. He was very much still conscious and alive. So... Through the Spirit that was alive, alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and he preached to the spirits in where? In prison. This is a strange language. Who are these spirits in prison? This describes them further in verse 20. These spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Let me stop here before we unpack the rest of it. Well, who are these spirits in prison? 
Well, there's been all kinds of theories about it. You know, some say, well, gee, it sounds like it's all the people that were killed in the flood in Noah's day. Jesus went um, and he preached the gospel and offered them a second chance. That's really reading an awful lot in the text, and it contradicts everything that the Bible says. The Bible says that when you in this life, your character is solidified, and that's the condition we are judged in. So that doesn't work. What does work is what 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says. It talks about some angels that violated their God-given boundaries and are kept in a place in chains, a place of darkness called Tartarus. Um, in the ancient view of, of the world of the dead, you had Hades. Hades was this place where both the righteous and the unrighteous dwelt together. You might recall Jesus in Luke 16. He tells a story of a rich man and Lazarus, a poor beggar. The rich man dies and he goes to Hades. The poor man, the beggar, who is righteous, dies. He goes to Hades. But they're in very different compartments. There's a chasm. There's a separation between uh, the departments of Hades. On one side, the rich guy who was ungodly is suffering. Lazarus, who was the poor beggar who died, he's in a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. He's in great condition. He's loving life. The righteous are separated from the unrighteous, but they're all in this place called Hades. The righteous were not yet in heaven. But then under Hades or in some lower region of Hades is this place called Tartarus. And Tartarus was the place where a certain group of angels that violated their boundaries were chained and imprisoned awaiting judgment. You have this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. You have it in Jude chapter 1, verse 6. In fact, if you want to just jot those down so you can check it out on your own, I'll repeat it again slowly. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and Jude chapter 1, verse 6 is where you read about it. And what was happening here is that Jesus went, and it doesn't say he preached the gospel. The word that's used here in the original, it's proclaim. He made a proclamation, and what he proclaimed is that he had been victorious. The powers of evil thought they had destroyed the purpose and program of God by crucifying Jesus. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that very thing, uh, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, if the rulers of the world would have known what they were doing, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory, meaning the dark spiritual forces, thinking they were defeating Jesus. In fact, they gave him victory because now, because he was sinless, innocent, there was no right to put him to death. Therefore, he had the legal right to substitute his righteousness for the sinfulness of humanity satisfying and upholding the justice of God, proving that God is just and that he's not going to overlook his law, but he's going to sustain it and he submits to it himself, creating also an incentive to turn people's hearts away from sin and back to God and creating a strong deterrent because it's saying that only those who repent and turn back to Christ will be forgiven because of Jesus' sacrifice and those that don't are certain to be condemned by that same sacrifice. So Jesus went into this netherworld, this Hades, and proclaimed to these fallen angels that were in chains in prison that they had failed and that their doom was certain, but that people were going to be redeemed. And then the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 9, that Jesus took those who were the righteous in Hades and ascended back to heaven. You remember he ascended after the resurrection, and he took them with him. That's why now, as soon as a believer in Christ dies, they go straight. Their spirit goes immediately to be with the Lord. It wasn't like that before the sacrifice because they couldn't be taken into heaven until the justice of God had been satisfied by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So that's what this very complex passage is talking about. These spirits in prison are not the spirits of humans. It's not some second chance. It is the proclamation to these doomed angels. Now, it talked about their association, their crimes were committed during the flood. If you want to know exactly what they did, read Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. And what you find is these fallen angels came down, mated with human women, and produced a hybrid offspring race called the Nephilim that were extremely powerful and, and large and brutal. And so that was the crime they committed. And of course, we know from Scripture that the angels also came after the flood and produce Nephilim as well. Okay, so that's just to unpack that very hard passage. Now, there's a little more in there that's complicated too because it starts talking about baptism. So let me pick up again. Uh, he says in verse 21, well, actually to get your context, go back to 20 because it kind of flows. It says, 
these spirits he was talking about who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. The same water that killed or brought judgment on the others in the world lifted Noah up and saved him, brought him into a new life, a new world. Verse 21, and this water symbolizes, what does it say? Baptism that now saves you also. Now, if you stop right there, it sounds like you've got to be baptized to be saved because it says baptism saves you also, right? What about the thief on the cross? Remember, there was two thieves. One guy was making fun of Jesus, and the other one says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day you will be in paradise with me. That guy wasn't baptized. Nobody got him down off that cross and dunked him under some water right quick before he gasped his last breath. The scripture nowhere teaches that baptism is necessary for salvation. It teaches everywhere that baptism is to be done because we're saved. It's telling people that I am not ashamed of my devotion to Jesus. I've died to my old life and I'm living forevermore as a follower of Jesus and I want everybody to know it. Look at me, my old self is symbolically being put to death in the waters of baptism, buried. And the new me is coming up out of that water. We don't leave it down there too long. We bring you up out of the water to live up. <laughs> Although I did almost, where, where's he at? Is he in the service? Man, I, I thought I was going to lose you, man. <laughs> thought I was going to lose you. Not sure what happened there. But <laughs> thought I was sending him right home to be with the Lord. Wasn't the plan, but... <laughs> anyway, baptism symbolizes the inward reality that I really have trusted with Christ. My old self has died and my new self is going to live by faith in Christ, following him fully forever. So notice what the verse goes on to say, and you'll see how it clears itself up. And this water symbolizes baptism, which now saves you also. And then it says, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What it's saying is, it's not the act of water washing over your flesh that gives you a standing with God, but it's what it symbolizes, that you recognize that when Jesus went to the cross, it was the dark forces of this world that crucified him, and now when you see that to you, you're dead to the world. All you want to do is live to follow Jesus. You, you are no longer a part of that system in your mind. It has no pull. It has no seductive force. And now since Jesus rose from the grave, your conscience is clear. You believe his promises that you have forgiveness of sins and eternal life as a free gift simply because you've put your faith in Christ. Not because of any righteousness that you or I have done, but simply by your faith. And so you have a good conscience toward God because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism means all that. The water is just the outward display of all that inward truth that takes place in a real conversion experience. Let me go on to finish it out. He says, um, verse 22, speaking of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Now, that was the original point. The people were being bullied and pushed around by the Roman Empire. And Peter is saying, look, it might look bad for you now, but your day is coming. They pushed and bullied Jesus around too. But now he's ruling and reigning over all. And he's telling these Christians, you be strong and courageous. And don't let this stuff, these trials, these sufferings sway you. He's going to continue the thought in chapter 4. So let's pick up there now. He says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the body, and by suffered in the body, it's talking about his death. Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Now, that's a little confusing, but all it's saying is this. Jesus suffered in his body. It means he died. And it says that the one that suffered in his body is done with sin. All it's saying is this. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen a corpse commit a sin? I mean, really. Corpses are sinless. You might have the wickedest rascal in the world, but once you put him or her to death, they're not going to sin anymore in this world, right? That's all that verse is saying. Now, it goes on to explain itself further what it means to us in verse 2. So when it says that we cease from sin, it doesn't mean that ordinary imperfect followers of Christ who desire to be free of sin reach a stage in this life where we are finally sinless. It's not what it's teaching, but it is saying we want to be, and we are pursuing that. Look at the second verse. It says, as a result, 
He does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires. Well, what does he live the rest of his earthly life for? But rather for, what does it say? The will of God. You see, I've died to my old human desires. I see they're, they're what's wrecking society, wrecking the world. And now I'm going to live for God's will because I know his will is always good, always right, always trustworthy. So that breaks the power of sin in our life and enables us to progressively remove sin from us because we see it as insanity. We see it as sand in the internal machinery. We see it always has the seeds of self-destructiveness in it. So that's all that verse is saying there. And look at what he goes on to say in verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousings and detestable idolatry. Uh, idolatry is the worshiping of any person, place, or thing uh, that, is, that you put in the place of God. If you're looking to a person, place, or thing to supply your sense of significance, security, or satisfaction, you, that is your God, whether you label it a God or not. You are worshiping that person, place, or thing. It could be your career. You might be looking to your career to give you your sense of significance, security, and satisfaction. That's your God. Okay, so idolatry is something that we can practice very easily. So Peter says something that's almost humorous. He's saying, haven't you had enough time living this way? I mean, look at it again. It's kind of humorous. He says, he says in verse 3, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do. Living it. He's saying, haven't you spent enough time in lust and in drunkenness? Do you need to get drunk more? He's saying, do you need to go to another orgy? Come on. Do you need to worship some more idols? He's saying, haven't you burnt enough time? Haven't you wasted enough of your life in sin? I'm just going to ask you, flat out, point blank. Have you ever felt like, man, I wish I hadn't wasted so much of my life following my own desires and living a life of sin? How many have ever felt, I wish I could pull back some of that time? And some of his experiences. That's what that's saying. Peter, he's reasoning with these Christians. He's saying, come on. You really want to be enticed by this stuff? He's saying, you've got to be kidding. You know, you're, you're dead to this. Or it should be. Now he's going to talk about the social impact of their, their change, strange behavior. He says, they, now he's talking about those that are outside of Christ, haven't yet been reconciled to God. They think it's strange. Here it is again. We look like strange people. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. Now again, this is an experience that some of us in here, maybe most of us have, uh, know it familiar. I'll ask it, how many of you perhaps have had family members, friends, work associates suddenly look at you with a raised eyebrow because you express to them that you've changed some part of your behavior, some part of your conduct. There's something you used to do that now you don't do anymore. And, and they're like, huh? What do you mean you don't get high anymore? What are you, crazy? What, what do you do? Do you do anything? How do you have fun if you don't get high? You know? They look at you like, are you, you think you're holy now, huh? You think you're better than somebody. How many of you, know, you kind of went through, because you're not living the way that you used to, they look at you and they, they kind of are a little bit ticked at you. You can see your hands on that one? Yeah. And they want to charge us with like, you know, and we're like, no, I'm not saying I'm holy. I'm just saying, you know, I trust Jesus and, and I really believe this is the way we were created to live. In, and I don't want to live that old way anymore. Hey, it, it, if you want to do it, you can. But I'm telling you, you're going down dead end streets. That's all I'm going to say. But I'm not better than you. But they, they start to, you know, get aggressive sometimes. He says, they think it's strange that you do not plunge into them with the same flood of dissipation. They heap abuse on you. Aren't you holy now? Stuff like that. Verse 5. Now Peter's going to assure the Christians again, though. He says, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. He's telling the Christians, okay, they may be bullying you now, mocking you, making fun of you you know, deriding you, but, but God hears this stuff. And they will answer if they continue in this path of sin. He's saying, don't, don't you worry, Christian. You'll, you'll be validated someday. He goes on to say in verse 6, for this reason, this is not one of these tricky verses, but, but it's not as hard as it may seem. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they may be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. All this is saying is that 
some Christians had already died. Some had no doubt been martyred already. They were judged by the men, the Romans of that time, as inconsequential rubbish to be pushed around and bullied, beaten, and maybe killed. So they were judged by men just by their bodies, their physical appearance. But it goes on to say, but in the spirit, they're living as sons and daughters of God, people of great power and destiny in the world to come. They live on. That's all that verse is really saying. It's, it's not you know, saying that there's some kind of a secret preaching tour going on in the world of the dead or anything like that. So in verse 7, he gets ready to urge the Christians for some behaviors that they need to do during times of suffering, the things they need to embrace. He says, look, the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Now, this clear-minded part, a major part of being clear-minded during suffering, and you're going to see how the rest of this unfolds, is you have to know the truth about life. If our expectations are not based on the truth about life, we will not have clear minds. During suffering, we will be confused. We will think those things that I mentioned earlier. God doesn't love me. God's not with me. He's abandoned me. He doesn't care. He's not there. He's punishing me. And that's the last thing we need to be going through our mind when we're suffering. We need to be clear. Here's how you can be and I can be clear. We need to accept it's a temporal inevitability, suffering. Listen to Jesus' words in John 15:8. 18. This was the last night he was with his disciples. He was preparing them for reality. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Remember, they called Jesus a glutton, a drunkard. They called him a demon possessed, a prince of demons. Called him all kinds of things. If you belong to the world, it would love its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. All this I told you so that you will what? Not go astray. We must know what to expect. If we expect the world to love us because we're aligned with God now and the world hates us, we're not going to be clear-minded like Peter said. We're not going to be stable. We're not going to be able to pray effectively. We've got to adjust our expectations to the truth that God reveals about life. Jesus says that they're going to hate us and he told us, told us this so that we won't go astray. Here again, his words. Last night he was with his disciples. I have told you these things so that in me you may have, what does it say? Peace. peace. Now in Jesus we can have peace because he's told us what to expect. But in this world you will have what? Trouble. Trouble. Could that be more clear? He, he didn't say, maybe, maybe you'll have a little, little bumpy here and there. But I've got you covered. You know, God will come swooping in and deliver you every time something bad happens. No. And yet there's a bunch of people that call themselves Christians that believe this kind of rubbish. And they are ill-equipped to face life. And the first time a real trial comes, their faith will melt away because it doesn't exist to begin with. Jesus couldn't be more clear. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. You see, when our expectations are aligned with God's truth, we're inwardly prepared. We'll be able to be, like Peter says, clear-minded, and we'll be able to pray and to pray effectively. We have to accept it's a temporal inevitability. Since the angelic rebellion, the angelic rebellion occurred before mankind was created, one thirty angels, Satan leading the way, rebelled against God, decided... We want to use our free will the way we want to use our free will. We want to lead our own lives. We do not want to have you leading us and governing us. And they broke trust with God. God insisted that can't be allowed because the only thing apart from his will is sin, which is self-destructive, socially destructive living. And so they started this thing. And then, of course, you know, it came down to this planet. Adam and Eve in the garden, Satan comes and tempts them, and before you know it, they say, yeah, we want to run our own life too. We want to get out from under God's thumb too. Sounds like a great idea. We want to be God. And then the Pandora's box was open, and evil in every form has flooded our lives and our world. It's flooded us physiologically and genetically. It's flooded us mentally and emotionally and socially and, and in every system of government and so on. You remember the story of the Pandora's box, you know? Pandora was, uh, you know, this, this creation of Zeus, and Zeus was going to give her to Epimetheus because Prometheus kind of ticked off Zeus. And so as a wedding gift, he gives her this great big urn. The word used here is not really a box. It's a big jar. It's a storage urn. It's a pithos is what the word is. 
And so he tells her, Zeus tells Pandora, though, he says, whatever you do, treasure this gift, but don't open it. Don't ever open it. Because in this big storage urn were all the evils possible in the universe. And, of course, you know how the story goes. If somebody tells you not to do something, how many of you know you want to do it, right? You're looking at a thing day after day. Sooner or later, you just got to peek inside. How many know I would have peeked? Can I see your hands? Yes. And the story goes, when she peeks, all the evils come rushing out and flood humanity forevermore. Zeus, by the way, doesn't get angry at her because the story goes he already knew she was going to do it. It's very similar to what you have in Scripture, but not quite. So the Pandora's box is now open, and because the angelic rebellion and because it's spread to humanity, suffering is an inevitability that we are wise to accept kind of embrace it, gear ourselves for it. That's what Jesus was saying, so that it doesn't jar us, shock us, shake us in any way. And Peter was trying to prepare the Christians for that. There's a portion of scripture in the book of Job, and Job was a guy that knew an awful lot about suffering. Matter of fact, if you want to know about suffering of every kind, physical, mental, in the family, vocational, uh, every way you could suffer, Job suffered. Just read the first two chapters of the book of Job. It looks like Job in the Old Testament, but it's Job. And you'll see that this guy was actually the favorite of God. God's bragging about him in heaven. And then Satan comes and challenges it and says, This guy doesn't really like you, God. You're, you're bribing him. He doesn't really like righteousness. Start taking some stuff away from him and see how good he is. And then the sufferings are inflicted on this guy. But Job is a guy who knew suffering of every sort. Okay? And he wrote these words in Job 5, 7. He said, Yet man is born to what? To trouble. As surely as sparks fly upward. Job says it's just inevitable. Man born of woman is a few days and full of what? Trouble. trouble. The sooner we accept it and stop being shocked by it, the better off we'll be. It's a guy named Todd Houston. Uh, he's a motivational speaker and interesting guy. Back in 1994, he heard about this project where they were trying to gather all the best mountain climbers in the country, and they were going to go to all the 50 states of the United States and try to climb the top of the highest mountains in each of the 50 states. And uh, they were going to try to do this in less than 100 days because this had been done before, but not in less than 100 days. And so he trained like crazy for a long time, getting prepared for this physically, you know. And then it got right down about two or three months before the event, and the money caved in. It was not there, and they were going to have to cancel it. Well, he was so disappointed because he had worked so hard, and he finally decided, man, I'm going to go raise the money somehow myself. And he started going around and talking and doing everything. And sure enough, he raised enough money to put the event back on, and he called it Summit America. Well, they started out, and sure enough, they started climbing one height after another after another. They ended up finishing this thing uh, in 66 days, which was like 30, I guess 34 days um, better than the previous record. And he was kind of the key, the catalyst in the whole thing. Now, that alone is interesting, uh, but here's what makes it more interesting. Let me show you this other picture of Todd. He has one leg. Thirteen years before Summit America, he had to have his leg amputated because as a young fella, he was in a boating accident. It was a, a suffering, an undeserved suffering. You might say it crippled him in a sense, but it didn't because there's no indication that he ever felt sorry for himself for one second. All he ever did, it seems like, is accept that, you know what, everybody gets some suffering and it doesn't mean that I'm going to be crippled because of something that happened to me physically. Listen, folks, there's some of us, probably right in this room, that we've had some suffering. We've had some hard knocks in life. We might have had some really bad hard knocks. I'm not trying to minimize it. But when that happens, when we go through these sufferings, we can choose to be victims and cripples for the rest of our life. We can go limping through life expecting that everybody should treat us special, that we're entitled to special treatment, and that we shouldn't ever have to be responsible. Everybody should say, oh, you can't expect much of them. They, they, they deserve a pass. They had it really hard. They were really, you know, they really suffered a lot. And, and we use this card to kind of 
find this protective place for ourselves, a million excuses why we can't, why we couldn't possibly, how could we be expected, and so on. We, we, we limp through life because of some suffering. And all we do is cheat ourselves. Cheat God, cheat the rest of the people that know us. There's no reason we can't climb every mountain that God puts in our way, regardless of what suffering we've had. There's not a suffering that anybody experiences that is any excuse to slow us down from being everything that God intends us to be and doing everything that God intends us to do. But if we want to play the victim card and go whimpering through life and demanding that we're entitled to special treatment, we can do that. Uh, I, I'd rather climb some mountains that God puts my way, and I hope you feel the same way. Catherine Patterson, uh, the writer of the uh, story, The Bridge to Terabithia, Ken Geyer, a Christian writer, talks about her. I think I have a picture of both of them there. Uh, in a book called Shaped by the Cross, Ken Geyer, he writes about Catherine Patterson. Uh, of course, she wrote the book that was based on her son David's loss of a childhood friend. It was his best friend. The girl's name was Lisa. Uh, the book, as I said, was The Bridge to Terabithia, which won the Newbery Medal for the best children's book of the year. In her acceptance speech, she described how Lisa's death affected her son. She said in the speech, he's not fully healed. Perhaps he never will be. I am beginning to believe that this is right. How many people in their whole lifetimes have a friend How many people in their whole lifetimes have a friend who is to them what Lisa was to David? When you have such a gift, should you ever forget it? Of course he will forget a little. Even now he's making other friendships. His life will go on though hers could not. And selfishly, I want his pain to ease. But how can I say that I want him to get over it? As though having loved and been loved were some sort of a disease. I want, I want the joy of knowing Lisa and the sorrow of losing her to be a part of him and to shape him into growing levels of caring and understanding, perhaps as an artist, but certainly as a person. And then Ken Geyer, the writer of the Christian book Shaped by the Cross, says this. He says, as a father, I want to shield my children from the sadness of friends who die young or family members who die old. I want to keep them from the frustration of flat tires and from the heartaches of lost loves. I want to shelter them from the uncertainties of life as well as its tragedies. I want to keep them from scoliosis and emergency trips to the hospital, from high temperatures and fe febrile, febrile, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, febrile seizures. I can, of course, I know that. Still, I try. Like Catherine Patterson, I want their pain to ease. But also like her, I want their joys and their sorrows that will shape them into growing levels of understanding perhaps as an artist, but certainly as human beings. Now, what you hear in both of these people is not just an acceptance of the temporal inevitability of suffering, but kind of an embracing understanding that suffering can be redemptive, that it can produce qualities in us that cannot be produced in any other way. I shared in the first service, and I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail, and it's not like a poor me trip or anything like that, but I went through some things in a certain season of my life over some years that, that did a good job of taking me apart and just throwing me like a bunch of broken pieces up in the air. That's how it felt to be me for some time. And, uh, and at the end of that, I didn't come back feeling dandy and great. But one thing I did start to notice. You see, as a Christian in my young Christian years, I would read things in the Bible where it would say, like, be compassionate, be kind, be tenderhearted, be caring. And I would want to do those things. I would want to be tenderhearted and caring and compassionate but the God's honest truth was uh, something was wrong with me inside I was just kind of hard and dead I mean I just couldn't feel I wanted to I tried to do the compassionate things but I just didn't feel much I went through this time that I would not have ever wanted to go through but I kind of brought a lot of it on myself to be true and at the end of the agony I started noticing little by little something that hadn't been there before. All of a sudden, I could feel. 
broken heart isn't the worst thing you ever have in your life. Being a broken person isn't the worst thing because sometimes you've got to be broken so that you can release your spirit, your heart inside. And I started seeing the capacity to feel and, and all of a sudden I actually started feeling compassion for people and feeling tender-hearted and feeling caring and, and it hit me that the thing that I had hated, the suffering that I had gone through, the thing that had kind of ripped me to shreds and I thought might destroy me ended up purifying and releasing something Christ-like in me that I couldn't produce in any other way. God somehow produced it from the suffering, the soil of the suffering brought forth these fruits of Christ-like characteristics. And that's the way God works these days in suffering and through suffering. Not only should we accept its temporal inevitability, but we should respect its eternal potentiality. God can take our sufferings and do extraordinary things in us, through us, and things that will carry on and endure all the way into eternity. Things of extraordinary value. There's a greater good than my comfort at times. Jesus' suffering is perfect for an example. He suffered on the cross, but he produced the salvation for anyone that would turn to him in faith. Eternal bliss in the kingdom of God. Because he was willing to forego comforts in this life. There's a quote by a guy named Dr. David Osborne. He's from Denver Seminary. I'd like to share with you. He said, too often... We try to use God to change our circumstances while He is using our circumstances to do what? Change us. We all pray, pray those prayers. Oh, God, save me, deliver me, take it away, give it to me, you know, whatever it is. You know, we want Him to change our circumstances. And sometimes He's saying, don't you get it? I want to bless you. And the way I'm blessing you is keeping you in this circumstance that is in entirely uncomfortable for you. You call it suffering. I call it the opportunity for you to grow, the opportunity of a lifetime. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.17 about the, the respect we are to have for suffering's eternal potentiality. He says, our light and momentary troubles, and this was a man that knew a lot about suffering. Okay, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, and if you don't, just read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 sometime in your spare time. He says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now, that's a blunt statement. He's saying, No matter what suffering we experience down here, paint it as bad as you want. He says, If we stay true to God in this, that God will more than compensate for it on the other side. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, which is what happens in this temporal realm, the sufferings, of course, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is what? Temporary. This is all going to pass away. But what is unseen is eternal. Now, you know, you've got to have real faith in Christ to live that way. You've got to really believe that Jesus rose from the dead, or that verse will never make any sense to any of us. It means we're going to stake our entire existence on it. We're really going to believe that no matter what suffering we endure in this life, God will more than compensate for it so that when the suffering comes, we will not shake our little fist in God's face and say, why are you doing this to me? Why won't you save me? Why won't you deliver me? Why won't you heal me? Why won't you do this? Why won't you do that? That's childish, immature, and self-defeating activity. Real faith says, you know, God, of course I want to be healed. Of course, I'd like you to extend my days. Of course, I'd like you to bless me. But you know what? Your will be done. Just show me what you want me to do to work out your purpose. I've said it before, and I want to say it again. If there's anything in our lives, anything that can shake our faith and our trust in Christ, anything, then our faith and trust in Christ is probably not real. We've all met the people. You know, they say, well, you know, I used to be a Christian and I went to church all the time, read my Bible all the time, I tithed, I, I served God. And then, then I, my sister, my sister came down with that, that cancer and I watched her suffer and suffer and suffer. And we prayed and we prayed and we laid hands on her and the elders came and laid hands on her. We prayed and we believed God and she suffered like nobody I've ever seen. And then she died. Ever since then, I don't believe in God. I don't want anything to do with God. He failed me. 
You hear those kinds of stories pretty frequently. I'm just curious, how many have ever heard a story kind of like that? The person used to be, but now they're not because of some disappointment like that. I ask myself, what Bible are they reading? You know what the answer is? None. How many of you know that there are people that go to church every day for a large parts of their lives that never really read their Bible? How many of you know that? Can I see your hands? Don't be one. God, please don't be one. And so when something actually happens that Jesus has already prepared us for, they're unprepared. And of course, they react instead of the way that would be beneficial to them, to all those around them, honoring to God and so forth. Just the polar opposite. They say, I don't trust God anymore because they never trusted him to begin with. They had a make-believe God. They had a bellhop in the sky that they conjured out of their imagination and a few, few fragments that they heard in church. They didn't have the real God. If anything can shake my faith or your faith, our faith is not real. Take that to the bank. I've said this before. I'm not some bastion of courage or anything like that. But I'm telling you, I can look you in the eye and say, there is nothing in this life that could ever happen to me. I don't care how severe that would shake my trust in Jesus. He has proven his trustworthiness, proven it by creating the universe and more importantly, by suffering and dying on the cross to pay for my sins. He is utterly trustworthy no matter what happens to me that has nothing to do with his trustworthiness therefore nothing can shake my faith weak imperfect though I am it's not about me it's about him and if you have real trust in Christ you ought to be able to say the same thing and that makes you a pretty strong person when you walk through this difficult dark scary world of ours and that makes us strange in the right kind of way the book of James talks about this same thing, that it's just normal. It's just something we should even kind of take a, a sort of a developmental joy in. He says, consider it in James, pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Trials usually produce sufferings because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature. You know what mature means? It means being like Christ. It says in Ephesians 4 that when we are fully mature, we're going to be fully like Christ. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature like Christ, in other words, and complete, not lacking anything. Trials are God's methodology to help you and I grow. We've got to accept that. Sufferings are not to be feared by the Christian. They can be part of God's developmental process for us. Over 100 years ago, there was a big cycle of tornadoes that ripped through Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, destroyed the little town, killed a bunch of people, uh, left hundreds broken and wounded and battered. And uh, just so happened there was an English surgeon that happened to be in the town and his two sons. And they just started working around the clock trying to, you know, serve and help anybody that they could. The brokenness was so bad. Uh, after things calmed down a bit, the people so admired them, they, they begged them to stay and to build a, build a hospital there. Well, the English sur surgeon was kind of old, and he thought about it a while and consulted his sons, and they thought, okay, well, we'll put up this little clinic. Let me show you the pictures of these fellas. There's the dad. There's the two sons. You probably don't recognize them. Uh, the dad's name was uh, William. One of his sons was also a William. He was a William W. The son was a William J. And the other son's name was Charles. Probably still don't recognize him. But let me show you this next slide. Their last name was Mayo. And that little clinic that came out of this disastrous piece of destruction that seemed senseless destruction came the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic has over 500 of the top doctors in the world on staff. They serve over 200,000 people a year. So out of this tornadic, senseless destruction, because there were some people willing to do good in spite of the suffering, God has brought something wonderful and miraculous. It's brought blessing to untold millions. I just got to wonder, has there been some tornadic-like, destructive, painful period in your life that you've maybe cursed and dreaded and tried to flee from? limped around, complained about. And God wants you to get in there and start healing people and serving people and 
rebuilding stuff and he wants to do something spectacular in the place of your pain and suffering not in spite of it because of it through it is it possible somebody in here has been running trying to run from some suffering and God says you know what stay where you are and work and build in the tornadic destructive area I believe it's probably true of some of us at least so the scripture teaches us we'll go on in verse 12 it says dear friends do not be surprised at the painful trial of your suffering as though something strange were happening he's saying this is just normal don't be surprised but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed if you're insulted it's because of the name of Christ you're blessed or if you're insulted because of the name of Christ you're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you remember Jesus said blessed are those that are persecuted for my sake verse 15 if you suffer it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler busybody however if you suffer as a Christian do not be ashamed but praise God that you bear his name for it's time for the judgment to begin with the family of God he's going to purify us now and uh, if, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And, and if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? What we know that even though we know God's will is better than our will, it's hard for us to yield our will over to God. That's what it means by it's hard for the righteous to be saved. And then verse 19 closes it out. It says, so then, those who suffer according to God's will. So suffering is God's will sometimes. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do what? To do good. So it says that suffering is not an excuse to run and bury ourselves. I skipped over some verses uh, earlier where it says that we should, during suffering, serve one another, love one another, use the gifts that God's given to you know, extend ministry to one another. But here it says that we should continue to do good in the midst of suffering. Suffering is not the time to back out and to run. Let me close with the story of a guy from World War II who gives us a real picture of, of a courageous Christian life in the midst of uh, some pretty harsh circumstances and sufferings. The guy's name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and maybe some of you have heard of him. He uh, wrote a book that's pretty famous called The Cost of Discipleship. I'm just curious how many have read it. In the first service I asked this too, there was hardly any. You, you, you should. It's a, it's a modern-day classic. It's a great book. He uses a term in there that's very pertinent for our day and age. It's called cheap grace. And what he means is the delusion that so many church folk have that just believing the facts about Jesus is the same as trusting in him and being his follower. Anyway, just a little aside. Bonhoeffer was in Hitler's Germany, and he was a Lutheran pastor. And when other Lutheran pastors were just caving in one by one by one and yielding up their will to Hitler and going along with all of his brutality, this guy refused. When other so-called Christians were just you know, embracing the fatherland doctrine and allowing the horror to be spread globally, he refused. He stood against Hitler's uh, euthanasia policies. He stood against Hitler's insane genocidal policies. Uh, policy against the Jews and his desire to exterminate them he risked his life again and again and then he took it further he became part of a conspiratorial group in fact a movie was made about it um, some of the inner circle of Hitler sought to kill him because they realized this this man's destroying the world he was part of that now you may consider that you know controversial for a Christian but um, he believed that if you do nothing in the face of evil that's evil in and of itself and he stood and he was persecuted and he was threatened and finally they arrested him in April of 1943 now most of you that have watched anything about World War II know that toward the end of the war 1945 I mean the last months the Germans were just beaten desperately badly to the point that Hitler in Berlin had children with guns his soldiers were just about all wiped out they had children standing there to fight to what looked to be his death, you know, just to the last person. So it was obvious that they were defeated. The Gestapo had arrested Bonhoeffer and uh, 23 days before the end of the war and they knew they were beaten. They knew the war was over, but evil does this. 23 days 
after he had suffered for that period of time, two long years, continued to preach Christ in the prison, gathered prisoners together to worship, led people to Christ while he was in there. 23 days before the end of the war, they took him out and the Gestapo hung him. And he died for his faith. There's another slide I believe I had of Bonhoeffer where his quote, he says, Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. So here he gives us a modern day example that no matter what the suffering, what the persecution, what the danger, what the obstacle, we are to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always sharing the truth about Christ with as many as we can at any cost. Let's pray. Father, you know that we're made in your image and it's no surprise to you that we hate suffering. And we know that it was not your original intention and we know that we, both angelic and human beings, have caused it. We know because of your goodness you intend to purge the universe once and for all of it and we are grateful for that. Help us now to be grown-ups and embrace this truth about suffering that we can live through it redemptively to your honor, to our good, and to the blessing of others. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.